Um, thanks so much for inviting me to Nicer Tuesdays. Really honored to be here. Some great speakers tonight. I feel like I've got quite a lot to live up to. Um, I actually planned a 10-minute talk, but I can see that I might have about 14, 15 minutes so I can relax a bit. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of introduction to those of you who don't know who I am. Um, I, am I was born in Scotland, so the Scots are taking over tonight. Um, but I've lived, I actually sold my tartan. I've been in London for over 25 years, and I haven't gone back, I'm afraid. So um, I think I call myself a Londoner now. And I've been working in illustration for over 25 years, doing all different kinds of jobs. I tend to think of myself as someone who works right across all kind of platforms of design and illustration. And, and, but more recently, I've been working in publishing. Um, I've done a lot of activity books for kids, and my most recent book was actually a book for adults on color. But today, I'm going to talk about, um, just concentrate this talk on picture books, which is something I've planned to do for a long time, but actually took me quite, it took me a long time to make one because um, I think it's one of those things you think anyone can do. It's like I just knock out a picture book. And actually, it's been the hardest projects I've done, I think, and I still feel like I'm learning how to do picture books. So I thought I'd concentrate my talk today on what I've learned in trying to make a picture book because there's quite a lot of little sneaky tips and devices behind picture books that you know, I think is really helpful that I wish I'd known before I'd started out. Um, so this, this is the first book I did called Bob the Artist, and he is a little skinny bird. With, well, he's got very self-conscious about his skinny legs. And the second book I've done, which is actually just out in a few weeks' time, is the follow-up to Bob the Artist, and it's called Bob's Blue Period, and it is loosely based on Picasso, um, Picasso's story of loss. So where to start with a, a children's book? Well, there's no right or wrong way to start a, a kid's book, actually. I think, in my case, I started with a character, but the, the reason I started with a character is because I already had one. I stole them from one of my other books. And I think I did that because I actually found it really hard to come up with a character. And I kept drawing this little bird, and I thought, maybe why don't I just write a story for him? So I gave him a name, I called him Bob, and I thought, I'll just write something for him. Now, one of the, the things I didn't realize about doing a picture book is you have to draw your character or characters quite a few times, be quite consistent, and you have to be able to draw them from all different angles. And I think I was used to doing one-off images, so this was a bit of a challenge for me. With Bob, the bird, it's not so difficult because he's a really, really simple form. He's literally a triangle and a, and a circle. But with some of my other characters, I really struggled to do different views and actually just keep a consistency in drawing. For example, the owl, I just couldn't do a side view for the owl. And I had this cat from another one of my activity books. I stole him, put him into the book, and he only had a head and shoulders, so I had to make a body for him. And again, I really struggled on that side view. And I came up with a, a little kind of sneaky way of drawing a side view, which is when you do a three quarters view. And a lot of other illustrators I've noticed do this, just think Charlie and Lola and think Miffy Mass, and they all kind of use that three quarters view to get away with doing, doing the side view. I, I also made it quite difficult for myself by choosing a character as a bird who doesn't have any hands. But I think I managed quite well to do these kind of birdy handy type things here. Um, so one of the, the things you have to do when you're doing a kid's book is I think you have to find your own voice. It's really easy to copy, um, and it's a great way to learn, but ultimately, it's a really competitive market. It's like kind of in stage, they've got, it's a kind of quite fast turnover, but the great thing is we have an insatiable appetite for the new and unique, and I think if I give you any advice, it would be just be personal and go for something unique. Um, with my characters and my stories, I try to bring things a little bit close to home. So I look around me to get inspiration, and um, this is our dog, Pip, who just always looks a little bit forlorn um, when he's lying in that chair. So I used him to kind of copy as a character for Bob. And I quite often look at him and see kind of similarities, and, and he crosses into my work quite a lot recently. Um, I mean, this is my son playing guitar, and I, I, I used him as a reference, whether he likes it or not. But if he sees this film, he won't be happy. But um, 
there's little details like the way he's turning his foot, his right foot, and I think it just gives your character an extra dimension when you've used that real life observation. I would never have been able to make that up, I don't think. Um, equally, I wanted Bob to be able to dance quite well, and so uh, I just looked at videos of Michael Jackson and tried to copy some of those cool moves. And, you know, Bob is a bit, little bit like a blank canvas. I kind of feel like I can sort of make him be anyone or do anything, and that's quite great to just kind of take ideas and throw them onto this little character. Um, because my background is, is art activity books, the, I suppose the premise of my picture books, I've got an art link to them. So I try to sneak in a little art reference. Um, in this case, Bob and Bat are painting, but this is copied, the, um, the kind of pose from a picture of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. And it just means you can take, the, the, if you're so inclined, you can take the the narrative of the, book, of the book a bit further if you want to, so if someone would maybe recognize this as Pollock, they could talk about that. Um, so see, some of the, the things I learned were things like this, like that you could say 90% of picture book stories can be summed up like this. What does the main character want and what's stopping them from getting it? And it's quite similar to the cog theory, which is character, obstacle, goal, and you can basically start dissecting stories and realizing that they kind of follow that pattern quite closely. Um, you can do that by reading, reading lots of kids' books. I, I read lots of books to my children when they were younger, but I never really fully analyzed them. I just kind of read them. And now, when I tried to do my first book, I just went to the bookshop with a notebook and pencil, and I just tried to take that sentence, you know, what does the main character want and what's stopping him from getting it or her? And you know, nine out of 10 books, you could kind of pull that out. And it was, it was a really great way to learn actually how to just write a kind of solid story. Um, I always write my stories with a combination of text and image because I'm making both the text and image. It seems to me the right thing to do to just work on both at the same time. So once you've kind of got your story a little bit fleshed out, you have to ask yourself what's at stake. You know, what's at stake in your story? Does it matter if your character reaches his goal? Um, if it doesn't matter, or you think, well, maybe it's not that important, then you've probably not got a story. Um, in Bob's Blue Period, for example, he starts painting everything blue. And you might think, well, that's not such a great big deal. But the blue becomes overwhelming until it turns into one big blue tidal wave. It, that then becomes a kind of life or death situation, and the stakes are much, much higher. So I think it's always worth asking the question, you know, what's at stake and make, you know, raise the, raise the stakes and make them quite high. You admire a character more for trying than their successes. Um, this comes from Pixar, actually, because they're really great for reading, because they're writing hundreds of stories and they're quite good at it. Um, you re realize that sometimes it's the balance of a character trying to overcome their difficulties that makes you like them more. Um, you can think of so many kind of main characters that are kind of almost failures, and we, we respond to them because we relate. Um, another thing you have to remember is that you need to create empathy for your character. If you don't care about the character, and you don't feel any kind of, kind of you know, emotion when, you, when something bad happens to them, then again, maybe your story's not quite working. So you know, make sure that you're, you really feel something for that character, and, and you somehow find either words or images to convey that. Um, keep it simple. Well, easier said than done, I think, but when you think that an average picture book at this kind of present time is roughly 32 pages um, and 500 words, it's not a lot of kind of imagery and it's not, it's not a lot of text and you've really got to make every word and every spread count. Um, you know, and that means kind of really editing your text and really looking closely at how, how strong you can make your story. With, with me, what I try to do is I try to make my images as simple as possible. And the reason I do that is because I really don't, I don't like drawing detail and I'm also not very good at it. So I try to find ways of taking elements out but still conveying a really strong dramatic image. And there's some things I just can't draw. I'm not one of those people who can just draw anything or everything. So I'll try to find ways and means of getting out of, say, drawing a tree. Um, then I'll, I'll do that. So work to your strengths, and I think it's a great way of, of making imagery. Um, 
I did some really great workshops at City Lit through some great teachers there, Lou Kensler and Sophie McKenzie, and I learned a lot on those courses. Um, they, they were really good at kind of taking you behind the scenes of how, how images work. And I, this is something I hadn't really spotted in picture books, but you know, the words, you shouldn't just illustrate the words. It's the most boring thing to do in a picture book. Really, the words should actually always say something more. And in the best picture books, they do this really well. They kind of almost contradict each other. Um, the way I kind of work with words is I try to have as little words as possible. So once I've got my story and pictures fle fleshed out, I just try to keep removing words until I can still, still, still tell a story, but there's very little in there. And really, I think my pictures are the words. And so I try to say as much as I can with the pictures without using, you know, with using very little words. I think this is a brilliant statement, and this is from the writers of South Park. And they, they, um, it's almost like their mantra, actually, and they obviously write hundreds and hundreds of stories. And they say, between any two scenes, you can fit the words, therefore, a but, rather than, and then. So rather than saying, and Bob, and then Bob did this, and then Bob did that, that doesn't really make a very exciting narrative. Whereas if you kind of do the cause and effect thing, and I, I sort of did this subliminally on my first book without really knowing that rule. Um, Bob is trying to fatten up his skinny legs, and so he tries something, but that doesn't work, and that leads on to something else. You know, he tries this, and, but that doesn't work. And he tries something else, but that doesn't work. And it kind of builds up momentum of the story through action, and I think it makes a much more a dynamic story. So dialogue is a great thing to use, and um, you can really, rather than sometimes, again, using past tense, you can just make your characters speak to each other. And sometimes a little, um, a little kind of test I do is I take two characters from my story and I just give them a fictitious dialogue. I might throw them in a supermarket and make them have an argument. It's nothing to do with the story, but it helps me find out their character. It's like, oh, they say that or they say that. And somehow when you work in dialogue, you say quite different things with your characters and you can surprise yourself, but it makes them just have those extra dimension and be a bit more real again. Um, there's lots of things to avoid in children's books. Um, I haven't got time to cover all of them, but I'll just cover a couple. One is being didactic. I mean, every day children be, are being told what to do and what not to do by teachers and parents. So the last thing you want to do is your kid's book to be doing the same. So both of my books deal with quite, quite weighty issues in a way, but neither of them are didactic. And, and Bob the Artist, for example, he is, they have an epiphany in both books. And in Bob the Artist, it's through the power of art that changes his ways. And in Bob's Blue Period, it's the power of nature. Nature, almost like a kind of ecotherapy. He has a kind of this experience. And I think what's really important, though, is, is what Bob does is through self-realization, he improves, you know, he solves this problem. It's not solved by someone else. It's not solved by a parent or a teacher. Um, I think it's a good point to remember. Um, also, avoid abstract language. Abstract language kids don't understand. And abstract imagery doesn't work either. I mean, I really wanted to, I just love this Bruce McLean performance piece. I was trying to sneak this, somehow this reference in with Bob and Bat. But I couldn't make it fit the story, and I couldn't make it fit the book, and so you have to cut. So it's another good lesson to learn that you sometimes just have to cut images that you like or ideas you like if, they don't, if they're not true to your story or they don't do anything for your story. Now, despite both my books being quite serious kind of subject matter, it's not what I ended... It's not kind of wasn't the plan. I, I just really wanted to draw... Um, a funny, I wanted to write a funny story and create a funny character, and we have more birds doing yoga here. <laughs> so I think one of the first things I did with Bob was kind of make him do yoga, because I realized if you can make a bird do yoga, I think you can kind of make him do anything, if you can do it convincingly. See, I managed to do a front view there, which is actually quite difficult as well. Um, also, because drawing can be anything, it's not to be limited by realism. And it's like, whatever you draw, the kids are going to believe. So don't be scared of being a bit surreal. 
um, it's always important to have a strong ending to your book. Um, really, the character should... It doesn't have to have a happy ending, but he should reach his goal or his problem should be solved, his or her problem should be solved. Um, in Bob's blue period, of course, he finds his colour again. But you can do this thing where you can come back to the beginning. So Bob loses his colours, finds his colours, but he doesn't quite go back to the same way. He changes a bit, and it's always good to add a little twist in your story. Um, but also using a, a return to the beginning of the story is also a really good device. So Bob loves to dance, loses his passion for dancing, but regains it again at the end. Um, so that is the end of the presentation. It's very quick, but I hope there are some top tips there that will um, for all of you budding um, picture book writers out there that I hope you maybe get something from that, write your own story. I feel like I've still, still got my best stories to come, so thank you.